The presentation which follows is a message which was done at our fellowship here in Jamaica at Albion. It has to do with the subject of prayer. Before we even look at this presentation, I want to challenge you with some questions. These questions have challenged me. And I touched on them in the presentation, but I think I really want to emphasize one particular question here at the beginning. And it is a question, why don't we pray more? I mean, I can think of people right now that I know who are very sick. I can think of people who are desperate, needing help. I can think of Christians who pray for people, but they pray just a little. Or they pray intermittently. I mean, if, if, if you knew that every time you gave me a call, you were guaranteed to receive $10,000. How many times would you call me each day? And if you knew that that $10,000 was guaranteed, when you called, you heard that I was busy, or you heard that I was somewhere else, or you heard that I wouldn't be available for a couple of hours, or you heard that I couldn't speak to you at the moment, would it stop you from calling again? I mean, as long as you know that there is that guarantee. As I was thinking about this, it came to me that the reason why Christians don't pray more is really because we don't have the assurance that we're going to have what we ask for. This is, this is a startling thing, a startling reality to consider. But if you look at yourself carefully, as I have looked at myself, most of us will recognize it is the truth. Think of people that you know who are sick. I can think of people that I know who have cancer, who are suffering from a stroke, or who have other sicknesses. And I, I was just thinking, how seriously have I really prayed for these people? And how consistently? I mean, from time to time, people will call and say, please pray for me. And I do pray. But how earnestly and how perseveringly? I realize that what, the, the reason why we don't pray more is because we really don't have that confidence that we have the answers to our prayers. If I knew for sure that every time I prayed, I was guaranteed to get a positive answer, or even if it's a negative answer, I was guaranteed to get an answer, then wouldn't I pray far more? Wouldn't I pray without ceasing? Wouldn't prayer become one of the, the great focuses of my life. It's with this kind of background that I want us to watch the following presentation. I believe that there are some important points that are made. And I believe that if you understand what is being said on this video, then prayer will become a far more significant part of your life. God bless you as you watch. This morning, I want to share with you some thoughts under the heading of the science of prayer. And, um, you know, when, when Brother Peter was calling for testimonies, something that happened this week, last week, in the recent past, I was going to get up and say something, Sister Ima, but I changed my mind because I said, I will save what I have to say until afterwards. <laughs> and I want to entitle my thoughts, The Science of Prayer. And I hope I can answer a few questions. I'm sure I can't answer all the questions. But I hope I can answer a few. And that it might be helpful to all of you as, I, as it has been very helpful to me. <coughs> now, all of us are in the middle of a conflict. Sister Heather spoke about her conflict this morning. I think other people, I don't remember what everybody said, but everybody has some kind of conflict. And sometimes we get confused about the conflict. Because there are so many issues going on in the world. If you talk to maybe an American, he will tell you that ISIS is a problem. If you talk to another person, he will say, my financial situation is a problem. If you talk to another person, he will say, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crime situation in Jamaica. That is my problem. Different people will say different things. But I'm speaking as a Christian. 
And I'm speaking from the word of God. And here's what it says in Ephesians 6 and verse 12. I'll give you half a... I'll give you 10 seconds to find it. Ephesians 6 and verse 12. The Apostle Paul says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness, in high places. All right, Paul says that when you see people wrestling, what is happening? There's a fight going on, right? Paul says we are wrestling, but he makes it clear there's a struggle. But we are wrestling not against flesh and blood. In other words, the enemy that we, we are contending with has nothing to do with humanity. We are fighting against principalities. Principalities uh, is, is, is authorities. Against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. So who do you think this is referring to? Satan, Satan and his minions, Satan and his angels. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, I want to just throw the challenge to you whether or not you really believe this. Because if this is who we are fighting against... We are in a desperate conflict because what do you know about fighting Satan and spiritual wickedness in high places? Is that really who we are fighting against? I mean, when I listen to, to our discussion day after day and the things we are concerned about, I wonder if we really see the conflict as against spiritual wickedness in high places. I, I never learned growing up how to fight against spirits I mean I, I grew up with 10 brothers and we, we would wrestle not 10 brothers 10 of us in the family but 5 of us brothers were in that same age bracket more or less just a year between us in the early days and we would wrestle a lot sometimes we would fight too and um, even when we were, were children that used to, used to sometimes box with us so we, we learned some little techniques about you know self defense but very little, very fundamental. That's all I ever learned. When I, when, I, when I grew old and started to play football, I learned about how to tackle and how to guard myself against tackles. I learned physical things. I never really learned how to fight in another way, in the spiritual realm. And I think most of us are in that place. We know how to fight. If, if, somebody, if the neighbor or somebody says something about us, we surely know how to respond and how to put a person in his place. We know how to go to the, the police or to the law and to get things done if we, are, if we are physically assaulted. But Paul here says that if you are a Christian and if you are in here this morning intending to be a Christian or serious about your Christianity, this is not our fight. This is not what we are concerned about. So as I was reading it, the thought came to me, do we really understand what we are doing? Now I want you to turn with me to don't, don't lose this place. We're going to come back to it in just a moment. But go to 2 Corinthians 10. And I want to read from verses 3 to 5. <clears throat> Paul, again speaking. And he says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but, but might is through God to the pulling down of strongholds, <coughs> casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So Paul tells you plainly that the weapons that we use are not carnal or, or what? What does carnal mean here? Flesh, they are not of the flesh. We walk in the flesh, but we do not war after the flesh. In other words, you exist in a physical body. You eat food, you sleep at night. You exist in a physical body, but you don't fight in that way. You don't use physical weapons like a sword. You often see pictures of the Christian soldier, and he has, on, he has a shield and he has a sword. And sometimes you see pictures of, Christian, of the Christian soldier fighting a battle with the sword. 
But actually, Paul says that's not the kind of weapons we use. Our weapons are different. And the weapons we use are mighty. What can they do? They can pull down strongholds. Again, I want to challenge you with the question, do you believe this? Go back to, go back to Ephesians chapter 6. Go back to Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to uh, finish reading that passage that we started. We're going to start from verse 13, and we'll continue to verse 18. Here's what it says. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. And having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. And watching thereon with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now I'll mention these elements of the armor, these, these weapons of the warfare. Let me mention each one briefly, but I want to focus on one in particular. Now it says that you are to have your loins girt about with truth. Uh, what you usually put around your waist is a belt. And I, I know that there are some people who believe in wearing braces. I've never felt comfortable without my belt. I don't know if it's a habit, right? But, but anybody who does any kind of serious exertion, physical exertion, can tell you that if your waist is weak, your whole body weak. You notice that a lot of weightlifters are people who do manual work. They have a big, thick belt around their waist to protect their, their back and their waist because... I used, to be, I, I used to be very robust, very active. I used to play soccer and all kinds of things. Since I hurt my back, it's like my whole body get weak. Let anybody who, who got his back hurt, Brother Vincent complains about a back problem. When your back is weak, the back is in the middle of the body. When, when, when your waist gets hurt around here, you can't function because it's the middle of your body that you used to uh, as a fulcrum for your body to move around. You're, you're, you're damaged if your back gets damaged. So... I advise everybody who has a good back, try to keep it. If it gets hurt, you are in trouble. Paul says you should have your lines girt about with truth. Truth is a thing that, that, that becomes the center of your strength. That is why it is true that we are saved not by the doctrines that we believe, but by our relationship with Christ. But it's also true why Jesus says, I am the truth. If your lines are girt about with truth, the central truth is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And in Him, God has declared Himself to the universe as He never did before. I was in a discussion last night with some people and the question was, is the God of Christianity the same as the God of Islam and Judaism? Well, I got into a lot of friction because I said, I don't believe the God of Christianity is the same as, as the God of Islam. Neither is it the same as the God of Judaism. Well, some people agreed with me when I said Islam, but when I said Judaism, even my friends started to turn against me. One guy came on and said, boom! I never knew anybody would agree with me on this, but this is what I believe. And as I started to defend my point, I tried to show them. They think that because Islam is monotheistic, and Judaism is monotheistic, and Christianity is supposed to be monotheistic, we all worship the same God. They say Islam calls him Allah, we call him Jehovah, the Jews call him Jehovah. Is that what it means? Is, is, is your concept of God dependent on the word that you use? How many gods do you know that has a son? There's only one God. How many gods do you know? How many gods do you know who manifested and revealed himself finally and conclusively and comprehensively through that son? Only the God of Christianity. Judaism teaches a God who is racially biased, who is segregated. Now I grant you, 
It's the same God that is the foundation of Christianity or the same concept of God. Grant you. But you see, Christianity now has Christ to help us to understand what that meant and why it happened. Judaism doesn't have that. Judaism stopped with that Old Testament revelation. So right now the God of Judaism is biased and prejudiced and is very little different from the God of Islam. Without Christ, Judaism is a false religion. It is Christ that makes Judaism or, or the Old Testament religion something different. You begin to see it in a different light because of what Jesus Christ revealed. Without Christ, Judaism is just as, as, as biased and prejudiced and narrow-minded as Islam is. We don't worship the same God. So, I'm saying this to say, to have truth is important. And Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. So your lines girt about with truth. You have on the breastplate of righteousness. Well, that's interesting. I could preach a whole sermon on that. Because you know what is the greatest strength of a Christian? You know what is the basis and the foundation of faith? It is the consciousness of righteousness. You know when you go to ask God for something, and the first thing you start with, Lord, I'm not worthy. You know what? You have half killed your faith already. Righteousness is a conviction that I am accepted. It's a conviction that I, am, I belong here. I'm in the right place. Again, it is Jesus who takes us there because he is our righteousness. But you need to have that breastplate of righteousness. It defends you. It makes you strong. It is able to, 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 to guard you against the darts of the wicked. It, it is associated with, the next, the, with one of the other weapons, which is a shield of faith. I was talking to somebody recently and he said, Boy, Satan. I stopped him. Did you talk about Satan, man? Why are you giving Satan so much credit? Satan does his duty. What is your duty? Your duty is to know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Yes. When you understand this, what can hurt you? Your best friend lets you down and you say, praise God, it is working for my good. Yes. Satan does the worst to harm you, whether spiritually or physically, and you say, Praise God, thank God for Satan, because he's working for my good. That's what faith does. Without faith, you're depressed, you're under gloom, you want to go and hide in a hole. Paul says, we are to take the shield of faith. We are to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What do you use your feet for? Traveling, walking, right? If your feet are trod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, it means that your purpose in traveling, in moving, in going from place to place, your purpose in going forward is to carry the gospel. Now let me tell you, people who are attacked by Satan are people who are not attacking Satan. Even if you played a sport, like when I used to play football or I played table tennis, I learned this. The people who get beaten the most are the people who play a defensive game. If you play an attacking game, your opponent is too busy defending himself to attack you. Attack. You have heard them say attack is the best form of defense? It's, it's, a, it's a psychological principle. It is true in the gospel. When you are constantly, when you constantly uh, 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 have your feet shod with the gospel of peace, you are, everybody that you meet, you're talking to them about Christ. You think they have time to get you into an idle chatter? You think Satan can get you down when every moment you are talking about the goodness of God? When your aim in life, your goal in life is to share the gospel of peace, you are full of enthusiasm and joy. You are the kind of person that when Satan sees you coming, he takes a different path. He knows you are too much of a challenge for him to face. The Apostle Paul says this is a part of the armor. He's talking about the weapons that we use, the armor that we use to defend ourselves as Christians. He says take the helmet of salvation, and that is, the helmet is what protects your head, isn't it? The helmet of salvation, it's what you know in your mind. It's the knowledge that I am saved. You know, I, one of the blessings I got this week was that somebody sent me a little book, a little e-book. And I, as I was reading it, the brother was talking about the danger of sin consciousness. I was blessed. I've been, that's been one of my blessings because I recognize it is indeed one of the problems, sin consciousness. How many Christians live under sin consciousness? How many labor under that awareness that I'm not worthy, I'm not fit, I'm not qualified? 
You come to God and how do you come? You come as a beggar. You don't come in the knowledge that in Jesus Christ I am qualified. Why? You are conscious of your sins more than you are conscious of the righteousness of Christ. You see yourself instead of seeing Jesus. This kills us brothers and sisters. Paul says that we are to take the helmet of salvation. The sword of the spirit which is the word of God. And probably I'll talk about that a little bit more so I won't say too much about it at the moment. But I want to come to the last thing. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. And watching thereon with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Well, I stopped at that one. I was listening to Heather's testimony. I listened to everybody's testimony, but when I listened to her testimony, she was talking about how she's praying these days. And so she's supplicating the Lord for her son. And I know I've, I've been praying for her probably every day for her and for Ray. And I'm praying for my brother Tony because he's, he seems to be dying of, or he seem, yeah, he seems to be dying of cancer. And I know that others of us are praying and we're praying daily and we're praying nightly and we've been praying for a long time. And it made me start to think. It, Paul says, praying always with all prayer and supplication. What is supplication? Earnestness. It's earnestness. It has a concept of pleading, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. yes. And when I thought of pleading, it sounds like begging, as Heather says. And many questions came to my mind because God is our Father. And we have been taught that God loves us. And we have been taught that God is willing to answer our prayers. We have been taught that he's more, he's more concerned about our welfare than we are concerned about our welfare. Why do you have to beg somebody who is on the same page as you? Why do you have to... Well, let me, I'll come to those questions in just a moment. But, uh, but, but there are some other things I want us to think about. How do we wrestle? What is the practical reality of this wrestling now i know as i said how to wrestle physically how do you wrestle spiritually what does that mean wrestle has the idea of rolling about trying to get a good grip trying to gain an advantage sometimes being at the bottom sometimes being on top and you're rolling about and you're struggling for the ascendancy paul says we are wrestling so so you get the idea that it's not a simple matter of speaking a word it's a matter of Speaking a certain way or, or using a certain method. What is it really? How do we struggle? How do we wrestle? The fact that there is a, a struggle is indisputable because the Bible says so. Yet we have the contention in our minds with what we know about God's character as opposed to what the Bible says is necessary. And that is one of the things that challenges us. I know when we started focusing on prayer a few years ago, one of the things we came up here and said is that if you pray for something one time, you shouldn't pray again. If you pray twice, it means that you, you don't have faith. I remember us saying that, right? I remember me saying that. And after a while, it didn't match my reality. And I began to look at those things in the Bible that say, you have to pray without ceasing. And so I changed my thinking. And I began to, to, to say that that is the way we should do it. And I began to look for a reason why we should pray that way. But you know, I, I realize that when you don't have answers, sometimes you get confused. And sometimes I get the impression that we're all a little bit confused about something. And that's okay in my estimation. It's okay to be confused if it makes you search more diligently. It's okay to be confused if you don't throw down your arms and say, okay, everything is a mess, I'm giving up. Because you were not born a genius. You didn't have all information. God doesn't tell you everything at the same time. So it's okay if you are confused. If it makes you go and search more diligently. That's one of the things I thank God for. That he does not allow us to become downcast. It's all a process of helping us to understand him better. And understand his ways better. It's interesting because you know. Usually. When you hear, if you ever read Revelation 12 and verse 10, Revelation 12 and verse 9, and you look at the pictures, it says, And the great dragon was cast out, and there was war in heaven. 
What do you normally see when you, when you read that verse? Angels with swords, right? And spears. You normally see the picture with them with the swords fighting and, 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 and Satan being thrown out of heaven. And you see him falling down with his sword in his hand and his angels around him with their weapons. It's very interesting because the Bible says that the weapons of our warfare are not, physical, are not carnal. So do angels fight with carnal weapons? It's very challenging. How do they fight in heaven? I mean, how? Magic. You watch too much video games. If they fight with magic and they throw beams of light at each other, or forces, elemental forces, then is it possible that Satan can stand against Christ for one moment if they are fighting in that way? How can Satan stand against Christ? If Satan has that power to stand against Christ, then we are in jeopardy. Because Satan is, it comes against us. Suppose it's one of the weaker angels that is defending me. But you have to believe that the weakest angel in heaven has power to, 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 to defeat physical power, to defeat all the forces of Satan. In one moment. So they can't, the fight that we are thinking about cannot be a conflict that is in any way physical. But it's a fascinating thought. What is this fight about and how is it done? Let me give you an example of this spiritual warfare. Go with me to Daniel chapter 10. We'll just read two verses there. We're familiar with it, but let's read it again. Now what is happening here is that Daniel has been praying about a certain matter. And what he did was he started to fast and pray. For, and he prayed for three weeks. Remember three weeks, right? And for those three weeks, he, he only drank and ate the, 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 the most. He said no meat came near his mouth. And he drank no, no wine. I guess he drank water, right? For three weeks. After three weeks, after 21 days, an angel came to Daniel. And the angel said, Beginning from verse 12. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me. And I remained there with the kings of Persia. What a confusing couple of verses. Daniel starts to pray and the angel comes and says, Look here, from the moment you started to pray, your words were heard. And I was sent to answer your prayer. But somebody stopped me for three weeks. And he refers to this person as the prince of Persia, the prince of the kingdom of Persia. And what we are to understand is that, is that this is not a literal man. This is the, 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 the power that was behind this man, which is Satan. Satan stands against him for three weeks that he can't answer Daniel's prayer. You say, what on earth is this? Then he says, Michael, one of the chief princes, which we believe to be Jesus in his pre-incarnate uh, form. Jesus came to help him. And then at the end of those three weeks, now he comes to Daniel and he begins to explain what was going on. And Daniel's prayer is answered. So you ask, what kind of conflict is this that an angel is unable to win the conflict for three weeks? And Daniel continues praying and he's fasting. But for three weeks, there's no apparent answer to his prayer. We see something happening, something similar happening in Jude verse 9 where it says that, that Michael the archangel... Contending with the devil about the body of Moses. What? So Michael the archangel, which is Jesus in his pre-incarnate form, he goes to raise Moses from the dead. And what happens? Satan, Satan presents himself to do what? To stop Jesus from raising Moses. And how does Jesus fight him? With words. Because Jesus says, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Now, he does not pull a sword. He does not cast a beam of, of energy. He uses a word. He uses words. And he says, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. 
and Satan box off. Now exactly what that means is something we need to study more carefully. And I'll, I'll give a few suggestions before we're through. But I want you to consider that it seems to me that the contest that is going on, or at least that was going on at that time, had to do with words. And it makes perfect sense because Satan cannot fight against Jesus by force. Whether it is, it is beams of energy or whether it is physical sword, Satan can't stand against Jesus or any of his angels. But why do words have such a power that they can stop God from doing what he wants to do for you? That's one of the questions. Yes, stop God from doing what he wants to do for you. Words. Probably like the whole system of God's fairness. You are getting on to my wavelength. But I hope to dig a little deeper than that. Yes, Sister Joan. That's a good question. If Daniel had not continued praying, God heard the first time. Would the angel have continued to be strong in that battle if Daniel had not continued praying? I don't have a clear answer, so I'm not going to answer. Maybe as we go on, it will come out, but I don't have a clear answer. Um, I want to read a couple of other verses. Possibly. You may be right. It may be more the subject of the words than the words themselves. But I'm also not going to downplay the words because you know what it says? By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. And it says the word of God is the what? It's the sword of the spirit. So I'm not going to downplay the words yet. I'm saying that it, I'm sure it's the subject of the words, but I believe the words themselves also. The argument are the subject, but also the words themselves because... Because the Bible talks over and over of the power of the word of God. Because Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Lord. As a matter of fact, I think I'm getting another sermon out of, out of the words of God that I want to share some other time. But if you look at Luke 5, verses 34 and 35. Luke 5. Luke 5. 34. And 35. The Pharisees, the, the, the disciples of the Pharisees wanted to know, the, the disciples of John, who was it? No, the Jews wanted to know, why do the disciples of John fast and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but Jesus' disciples didn't fast? And he said unto them, can ye make the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them. And then shall they fast in those days. Is fasting a good thing? Yes. Does Jesus expect his children to fast? Yes. Under what conditions are we to fast? Yes. When he's not around. So fasting is a part of this persevering that Jesus expects us to do. And the reason is because we don't actually have his physical presence. Interesting. You remember that um, on one occasion a man took his devil-possessed child to Jesus in Mark chapter 9. And the, the disciples were not able to cast the devil out. And later on Jesus said to them, it's because of your unbelief. But then afterwards he says, this kind does not come forth but what? But by prayer and fasting. By fasting and prayer. So Jesus said also that in facing Satan, casting out devils, one of the things that enables us to accomplish that task is fasting and prayer. So it comes back to Sister Joan's question. If Daniel had stopped fasting and praying, would God have been able to answer his prayer, even though the angel was sent at the beginning? And that's why I'm saying I can't answer that question and say, yes, it would have happened. Because Jesus says, fasting and prayer is a necessity. I'm going to throw an old question at you. Because I want to get the questions before we start looking at the answers. This is something that we have discussed here before. And I'm going to throw it to you again. God is good. God knows everything. God is in charge of the universe. 
God wants to save everybody. All things work for good to those that love God. Let me ask you. If you don't pray, will God continue to do everything that needs to be done? The Lord says boldly no. And I'm agreeing with Sister Lord. I want the question to be put to you because I want us to think about it. Because, you know, that question is, is, is kind of like throwing the, the question of, uh, questions of atheists at you. You know what the atheist says? They say, they say the God that we serve cannot be a good God. Why? Because babies are dying. Because babies are suffering. I've seen some of the most horrible images of human suffering that you can imagine. I've seen pictures of a madman, a madman in Kingston whose face got infected with, with worms. A human being. I've seen babies, parts of babies blown to pieces by terrorists. I've seen babies suffering, dying of starvation. You can see their backbone through their belly. The atheist will say, where is God? If you believe everything depends upon only the power of God, you will never understand when they say that God is love. Because how can a God of love allow these things to happen and he has the power to stop it, but he doesn't stop it. If you don't understand this issue of prayer, if you don't understand this issue of what is going on, you'll, live, you'll, you'll develop bad ideas about God. There is something involved that is more than simply the power of God and the love of God. And I want, if you never get anything else this morning, I want that to sink into your mind. There's something going on that is more than the love of God and the power of God. That's the most important thing that I want you to understand. Does prayer really change things? You have seen the sign, prayer changes things. Is that true? Yes. Will the dying person live if you pray for them when they would have died otherwise? Will the lost man be saved if you pray for him when he would have been lost otherwise? Will the starving person get food if you pray for him when he would have starved to death otherwise? Can it even be that a person will die and that will change if you pray? I want to challenge you with a question because if you don't have the right answer to that question, first of all, you won't see the need of prayer. And secondly, you won't be able to understand what is happening in the world. Even Jesus said to Peter, in Luke 22 and verse 32, he said, Listen, Satan, uh, Peter, Satan has asked for you that he might do what? Sift you like wheat, but what? I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. So I ask you, if Jesus had not prayed for Peter, would his faith have failed? Chances are it would have happened. I believe that Jesus' prayer made a difference. And if it wouldn't make a difference, Jesus wasted his energy. He wasted his time praying. His prayer made a difference. He prayed for Peter. He understood what was going on behind. And Satan went to God and asked for Peter that he might sift him like wheat. Something is going on there. Satan is bringing an argument against God. He's fighting against Peter. But is he using the sword? He's not using the spear or the sword or even sickness. What he's using is arguments against Peter, right? He has gone to heaven to use arguments against Peter and his arguments have so much strength that God is allowing him to do certain things. You see the same thing happening with Job and Jesus understanding what is happening. He says, I pray for Peter. I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. We understand what the weapons of our warfare are, but do we understand how to use those weapons? Do we understand why those weapons are so effective and how to use them? If we don't understand how to use them, we might be the most powerful people in the world who are living the weakest and most defeated lives. Sister Heather, and then... I'm coming to that. She's asking if it makes a difference now that Jesus has come and died. I'm coming to that. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think anybody could have prayed for Peter. Anybody who had a relationship, a, real, a living relationship with God could have prayed for Peter. But Jesus is the one who prayed. 
for Jesus was the one in the because he had that spirit of discernment. He would understand what was happening. He understood that was happening. He saw what was about to happen to Peter. Now, just a couple of other verses. I want to read a couple of other verses which demonstrate clearly that prayer changes things. Look at Philippians 1 and verse 19. The Apostle Paul says, For I know that this, for I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer. Now when he says salvation, I don't think he means salvation from sin. I think he means salvation from the situation he was in. I think he was in prison. And he was looking for deliverance, right? He was looking for being set free from prison. And he says, I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So Paul clearly believed that prayer changes things. If you look at, at Romans 15, verses 30 and 31. Romans 15. Paul says, now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers. That you do what? Strive. What does the word strive mean? Yes. Fight, struggle. Yes. Strive together with me, struggle with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints. So Paul is asking the people to struggle with him. So there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a wrestling going on, there's a conflict going on, there's a fight going on, and this part of it is being fought by words, by prayer. Yes, John? Hey, I'm, I'm hearing the word wrestling and I'm thinking of prayer warriors. Could you explain um, when prayer warriors pray? This is the next thing I have on my list. I have the question, is there something to this concept of a prayer warrior? Well, if you fight and somebody fights effectively, wouldn't you call him a warrior? Are there people who know how to pray more effectively than others? Are there people who know how to use the weapons of our warfare more effectively than others? Particularly the weapon of prayer. I, I, I have always balked a little bit at the term prayer warrior. Maybe because of how people misuse the term or because of how people are perceived. They think that because of their long speaking, it makes them a warrior. So maybe that is why I've drawn back from the phrase. But when I look at the Bible and the concept of the, 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 the fight of prayer and the fight of faith, I think there is such a thing as a prayer warrior. But it's just that we need to define that properly. You can find examples of it in the Bible. If you look at Luke 2, verse 37, it speaks about this woman who, came to, who, 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 who was introduced to Jesus when he was just born. This woman, Anna. It says, And she was a widow of about four score and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. Now you'd say this old lady waste our time. Night and day all she do is pray. And she sit down in the temple night and day praying. But guess what? You know what God did for her? She's one of the few people that recognized Jesus Christ. Two people recognized him when he was a baby. This woman Anna and Simeon the old man. You think it was chance or accident? You think God was hearing her prayers? Those, that, that incessant fasting and prayer. You see, it was not just a ritual. It can be ritualism. I accept. But this lady was sincerely seeking God and developing a relationship with him through what she was doing. And it enabled God to work in her life more than he could work in the lives of many others. So in this sense, I would say that this lady was a prayer warrior. You also remember the case of Cornelius. Cornelius was praying. He was a Roman centurion. Was he one of God's people? Not as they were considered in those days. Because the Jews were supposed to be God's people. But what was he doing? He was praying constantly and giving gifts.
to God, his prayers and his arms. And it says, the angel appeared to him. And the Bible says in, in Acts 10 and verse 4, And when he looked on him, he was afraid. And he said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine arms are come up for a memorial before God. God was hearing his prayers. God was seeing his commitment to God. And you can think about other examples, right? You think of the Syrophoenician woman. We don't think of her as a prayer warrior. But I don't think most of us have ever prayed like that woman. She comes to Jesus and she says, Lord, please, son, son. Jesus says, look here. I don't even look at you. And she keeps on praying. Everything is discouraging. He, she keeps on praying. The, she, she, she says, I can't get through to him. Let me go to his disciples. She go to, goes to his disciples. They don't have anything to give her either. They, they kind of try to discourage her. And, and she won't stop. And they, and they come and they say, look here. Send her away because she's bothering us. What do you want to hear more than that? You don't have any mind? <laughs> Jamaica would say, you're shame tree dead? <laughs> go about your way, right? But, but Jesus says, I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. There it is, the conclusive word. Go your way, lady. She does not give up. She keeps on coming. And Jesus finally, he puts the nail in the coffin because he calls her a dog. He said, it is not fit to take children's bread and give to dogs. But she will not stop. That is a prayer warrior. You can't, she says, Lord, what even the little dogs under the table pick up the crumbs. And what does Jesus say? Woman, great is your faith. He shows her what has been in his heart all along. Why has he not responded? Why has she had to stay there begging and pleading and praying? Yes, because praying is asking for something. Why has she had to remain? It's because something is happening in the background that is not obvious to her. But she hangs on to this that this man will not let me down. I have to get what I need from him. This is a prayer warrior, somebody who is not discouraged by circumstances, somebody who will not allow even the words of God to turn her back. Not even the words of God to turn her back. Somebody who trusts God so much that even his words cannot turn her back. I think she had heard about him and she had seen how he operated. And so she knew. She knew that this person that I've heard about, this person, I see something there, and the words are not expressing what I see. Words against the words. Jeez. Words against, against the character. Let me put it that way. That is why when somebody tells me that, the Bible says that God creates evil and he creates good. Rubbish! The God I know doesn't create evil. They say, God says, I love Jacob and I hated Esau. Rubbish! You interpret that another way. The words are there. But is that what they mean? No. Not the God that we know. He hates nobody. So, when you understand his heart, you begin to understand the words better. Um, that does my life also depict a life of prayer versus an attitude of prayer? What I mean is, the, um, in, in her situation, I don't picture her those eyes, you know, I don't know, some people drop in the street praying, but rather the light. She's not, she's not practicing the ritual of prayer, but she's praying in the sense of what prayer really means. Quite right, Brother Maurice. So, let me go back to those troubling questions that were introduced at the beginning. Why must we wrestle against a defeated enemy? Man, if the man is knocked out and lying on the canvas, why do you wrestle against him? Because he is knocked out because, because Jesus says in John 12 and verse 31, Now is the judgment of this world. What? No. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Right? Yes. In Revelation 12 and verse 10, when Satan is cast out of heaven, the voice from heaven says, Now is come what? Salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. Satan has no more power. He has been cast out. Why must we wrestle against a defeated foe? Secondly, why should we pray repeatedly if God is already willing? 
If he was willing from the beginning, why should we keep on praying? Thirdly, if God knows everything and God wants to answer, why does he delay necessitating perseverance? Again, as Sister Heather asked the question, we can understand the obstacle to prayer during Old Testament times. But what is the barrier now? Is there a barrier now? Because in Old Testament times, Christ had not died. No. When, Jude, when, when, when Michael came to raise Moses from the dead and Satan appeared, look, here's what he said. Look here, this man died a sinner. How have you come to raise him from the dead? He died under my power. He belongs to me. Because Christ did not yet have the key of, of death and hell. So he had a point. But Jesus has now defeated Satan. Does he have any power anymore? That is the question. Some, some people might say, well, God simply waits and God delays because he wants to build the, the believer's faith. I don't accept that. I don't accept that because when you look at the, the, the works of the apostles, you don't find this happening. You don't find this long delay when they ask God for something. You find God responding immediately. So why this long delay? What is really going on? Well, I'm going to suggest something to you. I'm going to ask you to read another couple of verses with me. That brings something else into the picture. Look at Revelation 5 and let's read verse 8. It says, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts... And the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. Hold on a little. Who are these twenty-four elders? We believe they are humans who once used to be, uh, be here on earth, but they were taken up to heaven at the time of Jesus' resurrection. Matthew talks about it. But the point I'm making is, what are they doing involved with the prayers of the saints? When you pray and I pray, it seems like our prayers pass through the channel of those 24 elders. Is this what it suggests? So, it may not be right to think that God is the only person involved with our prayers. Does that make sense? Maybe not. Because you think there's one God... And there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. But here the Bible presents somebody else involved, which are these 24 elders. Even though Revelation is a symbolic book, it means something. God is trying to say something, and we're going to, to see if we can figure out what is this saying. Brother Vincent. Um, it says they have the prayers of the saints. That is us. Right, right. Now, we know, of course, that Jesus is our mediator. And when we think about what that means, I mean, most people think that that means that Jesus is begging and pleading for us. But I don't believe that Jesus needs to beg and plead with God for God to do something because the same attitude that Jesus has is the same attitude that the Father has. But the Bible presents him as a mediator because, in fact, if you look at Revelation 8 and verse 3, the work of Christ is represented there by another angel. And it says, And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all, with the, prayers of all the saints, upon the golden altar which was before the throne. So notice, it's not just the prayers of the saints, but it's also incense being mingled with the prayers of the saints. And what does this incense represent? It represents, I believe, the righteousness of Christ. Remember that? They, 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 were, they were told to make this incense. When they were building the, the sanctuary, God told them to make a certain kind of incense, a special kind of incense that they were, used to anoint, they were to use to anoint the sanctuary and anoint the priest. And nobody else was to make any, any oil like it in Israel. If you made another oil like it, you were to die. And this is what the incense was. This incense represents the righteousness of Christ. Now we are accepted with God, by God because of what? Because of Christ's righteousness. In other words, 
When we are in Christ, we are accepted. Everybody accept that? When you are in Christ, how much are you accepted? As much as Christ is accepted. Whose righteousness do you possess? Christ's righteousness, and it is the same as God's righteousness. Because it says in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. That what? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. In other words, my brothers and sisters and my friends, when you come to God in Jesus, look here. You are as righteous as God Almighty. Whoa! And you sit around moaning about your sins and whether you are accepted by God. You are as righteous as God Almighty. And if you are as righteous as God, what can you ask for that God will not give? There's nothing that Jesus could ask for that you can ask for that you are not entitled to because you come in Christ. But remember this. Here's the point. Here's the point. There's only one person who is entitled to these benefits. And who is it? It is Christ. Your authority is because you are in Christ. Outside of Christ, you're entitled to nothing at all. God is not entitled to give you anything outside of Christ. In fact, it's not just that God is not entitled. God has no, has no right to give you anything outside of Christ. I'm going to prove that to you. Why is it that the little babies die? Suffering in the worst kind of way. Why? Sin. But something more. Do Christian babies die like this? I don't believe it. Christian babies don't die like that. Babies that come from a Christian, a truly Christian family. When David said this, I have been, oh, I've been young and now I'm old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. I can echo that and I can say the same thing for this David. I've never seen it happen. If you see the righteous forsaken and the seed begging bread, let me tell you, that is not really the righteous. God, there is a difference between those who belong to God and those who don't. Whatever anybody might say, this is what the word of God says. Christians are children of the Most High. I'm not saying we don't suffer. Christians suffer. But I'm talking about certain kinds of suffering. There are certain things that when it happens, you have to say, this, this, this is not God. So you're saying um, those who were, uh, like, were torn asunder yes. by, by horses. Wild horses. Yes, and those who made Nero's backyard. He like, used them to light fires in his backyard. Mm -hmm. These people, their death was for the glory of God. They died singing and happy. These people died as conquerors. The people I'm talking about is people who died begging for help, begging for, for mercy, and nothing happened. In the Middle East, not one of these children who, what we know, they attack Christian homes of recent. And, and we have seen some pictures, you don't think. What we don't know is those who were delivered. What we see is those who were not delivered. That's what we're talking about. Right. And those who were not delivered, I'm saying, granted. There are some of them who died for the glory of God. I'm talking about those who were begging for deliverance and didn't get it. Christians don't die in fear. Christians don't die begging the heathen for mercy. They don't die that way. When a Christian dies and he faces his conqueror and says, for the glory of God. That's different. When somebody dies in fear, where fear begins. Okay, okay, okay. That, that, is, that is evidentially clear. I mean, well, that's fear, what I'm saying. Much. Right. That in itself is an That's evidence. And when you die without fear, that glorifies God. But, I mean, for example, when you see a child in Africa, okay, his backbone through and through his belly, you think that child is under God's care? Um, I, I want to question because, I don't know, but I can't believe that the child is under God's care. Impossible. In the continent of, of Africa, there are millions of hungry children, and so that there's none of them are of a Christian. God sent manna from heaven still. Mana still can fall. I think about this greater than just the evidence right now. When I see a child of God, 
starving systematically, not for a day but or two days, for weeks and months till he dies in that condition, drunk or waiting nearby to come and eat him. That is a child of God. No, no, no. You'd say, why doesn't God intervene? Why doesn't God Almighty intervene? You want to talk like the atheist if that is true. You want to say, there is no God, it's a mirage, it's an illusion. Yeah, nobody for that child. Thank you. That's right. That is my conclusion. So, so, so because God, exactly. No, not what a God. That is the point I'm making. Why is it necessary that it should be so? Because once you begin to think that because God is God, God can do anything, then every act of suffering on the planet, you have to give God the credit for it. Every act of suffering, because God can do anything. Because you say, if I was God, no more criminal would murder innocent people in Jamaica. No more babies would be thrown into the fire. If I was God, right? Because we are so stupid, we only know about almighty power. We don't know about justice. The considerations of justice that require God to be limited in how he operates. If you don't put this into the picture, you will always have wrong ideas about God. Say, for instance, I'm a sinner, a rabid sinner. My child is in a situation where God saved my child, but the other child, the children in God bypass, that would be partiality. So I quite agree, the system of how God operates, it can be partial. Right. It can, and it can save me and don't save the starving children down in Africa. Because and Satan is sin. ready to accuse him. Right, you are perpetrating If he interferes with Satan's property, Satan right. is ready. Right. And that accusation is a real accusation. Um, you are going to say something. Oh yeah, I was saying, if God could do anything, then this whole history of earth would not... Sin would, have, sin would have ended long ago. That's right. So, so there are three things I want us to consider. Three important factors. Number one, here's what you can't. A Christian will never have doubts about this. God loves us with an unconditional love. He wants to do good for every one of us. He wants to make us happy. That's one. Number two, God has provided a way for this to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Christ is my righteousness. Christ is my wisdom, righteousness, Redemption and sanctification. Everything. But this exists in Jesus Christ. Thirdly, thirdly, there is a legal issue involved in how God deals with us. God is not the only person involved. Satan is involved. And the universe is involved. Those two factors are going to determine how God deals with us. Let me give you an example of it. This was from the Old Testament. But when Satan came to God and said, Job, give me him. And I'm going to show you that he doesn't belong to you. Did God have to do this? Somebody come to you and say, look here. Put your head under the truck and see if it, it's, it's going to burst. Do you have to do it? Somebody comes and says, let me see. I mean, they, they, they dare you and they challenge you. Like when you were children, they dared you in stupid ways and you went and jumped off the place just to, to meet a deer. Is that what God was doing? No, God is not stupid in that way. What happens is that the whole universe is watching to see these two great powers and to see where right lies and who is correct. And God has to allow Satan certain limits, certain, certain privileges in order to prove the point once and for all and forever. And a part, of the, a part of the conflict is that God will not interfere with anyone that is Satan's property. We are born as Satan's property. When we choose to be Christians, we take ourselves out of that place and put ourselves on, on safe ground. If you don't make that decision, and if nobody is praying for you, you are Satan's property. He can do anything he wants with you. Huh? He won't interfere. When you say again, I don't understand. <laughs> okay, the flood. All right, yes, he's reminding me that God interfered in the flood and in Sodom. But when he interfered in the flood and in Sodom, it was not to save humanity in a way. It was to stop Satan from getting, it was to stop the increase of wickedness from getting to such a place that there would be no hope for the human race. It was to stop it before it got too far. Before we destroyed ourselves. So it was not like, like he was saying. I'm going to take these people and convert them. 
He was stopping the rise of wickedness, both at the flood and at Sodom. So, what I'm saying is that the conflict that is taking place is not a physical battle, but it's a spiritual one. And because of this, in this battle, God's physical power is limited. It's limited. God is limited in the way he exercises his physical power. And that's one thing we have to consider. Now, today, Jesus is the basis of all we are entitled to. The question is, the one question that remains is this. Is our relationship with Jesus genuine? That's the question. Satan cannot stand in the way of our blessings anymore, like he did with Daniel. And like he did with Job. Because in Christ we are entitled to everything. But there is still a question. Is my relationship with Christ a genuine relationship? If my relationship is not genuine, does Satan have power over me? Yes. Yes. He only has power over the person who is not, who is truly having, what did I say? He only has power over the person who is not truly a Christian, even though he might make the profession. Does he have power over you who profess to be a Christian? Are your prayers being answered, you who profess to be Christians? I want to challenge you. Now, if it were you and God alone, Sister Heather says she get up and she wake up, she lift her thoughts to God. You see, your, your testimony is stuck in my mind. It made me think. Because that is between she and God alone. That don't pass through the 24 elders. That doesn't pass through the public arena. That is not a legal, that doesn't have any legal grounds or standing. I'm not saying it's not good. It's good because it develops my relationship with God. But in terms of answered prayer, which is to take place in the public arena on a legal basis, do silent prayers have any effect? Alright, that is my challenge that I just get. Because I always was thinking of prayer as me and God alone. But if you begin to look at it as something that involves the public arena, then does that private thing between you and God have as much effect as a public declaration? Like when Jesus talked to God before he raised Lazarus. Okay? But I'm not even... I'm not even Looking at uh, highlighting that as one of the main things. You remember Jesus says, Whosoever therefore shall confess me where? Before, before men, what? Before. Him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. When he says confess before men, why doesn't he say whosoever shall confess me in his heart, I'll confess him before God? He's talking about the public demonstration of where your heart is. This gives him the right. This gives God the right to intervene in your life. Is what he seems to be suggesting. Suggesting. What I'm suggesting is that the more clearly you can demonstrate faith in Christ. The greater God's right to answer our prayers. That's what I'm suggesting. And I'm beginning to think about certain things. There has to be a measurable reason for God to intervene in your life. He has to be able to measure something. Look at this statement. Jesus says, He that loveth me will keep my commandments. And he that keepeth my commandments shall be what? Shall be loved of my Father. Hold on. You don't think God loved you before? Doesn't God love everybody? Does he? So why does he say, he shall be loved of my father? Future tense. Conditional and what? Conditional and keeping my commandments. What he's saying is this. If you love me and keep my commandments, God will be enabled to demonstrate his love towards you. Not love you, but demonstrate his love towards you. He's talking about what can be revealed by God. Because God loved you all along. It was always in God's heart before you were born. But he's not able to show that love unless you demonstrate your commitment to him. You get what I'm saying? Because the whole controversy is being played out as a public demonstration. It's not private between you and God and Satan. It's a public thing. It involves the watchers and the holy ones in heavenly places. Once you begin to get that concept, things change a little bit. So if I'm asking God, God for something, I'm going, to, I'm going to say it on the top of my voice. And if I'm healing the sick brother Maurice, I'm going to say it 
with authority and power because I believe. Yes. The little half-hearted statement that says, I partially believe or I wish or I hope. Don't expect that that is going to carry any power. It's the demonstration of faith that gives God the authority to work in your life. It's a demonstration of faith. Not just a statement that I believe. Not just a feeling that I might believe. It's a demonstration of faith. Look at the Bible. Jesus said that ten men came to Jesus and said, you have leprosy, please heal us. What did Jesus say? Go show yourself to the priest. Were they healed at the moment? No. When they demonstrated their faith and they started going, then they were healed. Look at the seraphine, the, 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 the woman that touched his garment. She's there in the crowd. Jesus is there. She's in his very presence. Is she healed? No. She demonstrates her faith. She says, if I can but touch the hem of his garment. She reaches out and touches his garment. And she's healed. It's the demonstration of faith that enables God to intervene. And I think we need to understand better how to fight this warfare and what is really involved in it. Yeah, the works that we think of sometimes are, are misguided. You know, sometimes we interpret it the wrong way. It's very important that we understand the public nature of the battle that we are fighting. That's a part of it. it, it I, I believe that the prayers that I'm praying for somebody are the prayers that I'm praying and requesting something from God. I believe now that it is better if I openly and vocally declare what I'm saying. I know you mean well, but what you are doing is giving Satan greater power than God. That's what you're doing when you take that position. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that you can communicate with God in your mind, but I'm saying when you're asking God for something and expecting God to act, you should speak out. Yes, because God alone can read your mind, but what about the watchers and the holy ones? What about the 24 elders? What about the other people who are involved? They can't read your mind. It's a secret thing between you and God when you pray in your mind, but there are others involved. That's what I'm trying to say today. There are other beings involved. Okay, if you read Daniel 4, it says that Nebuchadnezzar got a dream. And in the dream, it, it was told him that he was going to be mad for seven years. And it says, this is by the decree of the watchers. And the command is by the word of the holy ones. It mentions watchers and holy ones. And what, 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 if you weren't here when you were doing the first part of the study in Daniel, but what it says is that God does not arbitrarily make decisions. There's a heavenly tribunal. Watchers and the holy ones. It involves the angels who are seeing what is happening because God does not just act in that way. God makes sure that whatever he's doing is recognized as being just by heavenly beings. If they don't see that God is acting in a fair way, God cannot act arbitrarily because Satan has accused him of being unfair. And to disprove Satan, he has to act transparently in everything. So he's not making personal arbitrary decisions. He's doing everything with the approval of that heavenly judgment hall. Put it that way then. So, so once you understand this. So how do they, they hear who we agree? Because there are angels who are with us constantly. So, so once we begin to understand the public arena. Yes. And as, as Paul says. We are made a spectacle unto what? Unto? You don't know the verse? Somebody find it quick for me. We are made a spectacle because I don't want you to think I'm quoting spurious verses. Just look for the word spectacle. It's probably the only place in the Bible you'll find it. I might even find it before you. Spectacle? It doesn't mean glasses. Mm-hmm. It's 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 9. 
Well, he's talking about the apostles, but the principle applies. If you look at what he says in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 9. For I think that God had set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto, unto the world, unto angels, unto men. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 9. So the principle is there. And I think I have to stop because it's late. The principle is there that God, that we, what is happening here on the planet earth is something that is being observed by angels. So anyway, once you understand this, our whole approach to, to prayer and to asking God for things takes on a different aura, a different level. Yes, thank you, sir. thank you. So, I think, I think it's just about time for me to stop here now. But I want you to know. I mean, ob- but I want to say that a difference between observation, I mean, all of the creatures, holy creatures in heaven, observing earth. But do they have to be approved of everything? They have to give their approval of everything? I, I wouldn't say so. If I, if I may use our families as, as illustration. When your children were small and when my children were small, I didn't ask their approval before I did things. But I, I, I would not want to do something that they thought was unfair. You understand what I'm saying? I tried to do everything so that they could see that their father is a man that can be trusted and he's fair. If I had to operate in a way that was unfair, it would bother me. I remember my mother did something once that none of her children have ever forgotten or will ever forget because it was so unfair. Because my, my brother Paul, we lived upstairs and there was a shop downstairs with a piazza and every day he went down the piazza and she said don't go down there and she would spank him and every day he's down there one morning as soon as he got up she said I know you're going to go down there today let me beat you from now (laughs) and she gave him a beating (laughs) look here it's a joke among us all the time because we say mama beat him in advance (laughs) so she was classic but the, 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 the point is, even though you don't make the decision, you recognize what is not fair. And so even though I don't think in heaven they have to say constantly, God you may, or God you may not. No, but they are watching, and God is careful that everything that he does, everybody knows that it is fair. He's not going to interfere with Satan's property. Even if his heart is breaking, he doesn't have the right Adam chose Satan's way for the whole planet. And now God says, I'm giving you all a chance to get out of it. And he sent Jesus Christ and he says, there is a way out of it. It's my son. So we can choose Jesus and that can enable us to escape out of that. If we don't choose that way, we are still Satan's legitimate property. Yes. That's a hard question. I believe that it seems like there are times when there are exceptions but there has to be some reason for the exception. The exception may be somebody praying for somebody. You know? So it's not an exception. Because God always operates on consistent principles. If he steps out of that, then you go back to being arbitrary and unpredictable. So anyway, Sister Heather. No, no, no. I, I, as I said... Communication between you and God as a friend is great. But I'm saying in terms of fighting the warfare, it's a public warfare in the public arena. Whatever you are doing needs to be demonstrated in a public way. It, it has helped me. I'm not going to pray the same way like I used to pray. I'm not going to pray the same way. I believe in Jesus Christ. We are entitled. But I want heaven and Satan and everybody to know. That I believe in Jesus. That I belong to him. And my words and my behavior and everything must demonstrate that fact that God has the right to work in me and through me. I hope that what we have shared today helps you to understand some things a little bit and gives you something to think about and some way to to, to search more carefully into how we can fight or use these weapons of our warfare.